Does it ever bother you that the story of a man mm -hmm. who was born of a virgin, was resurrected, your bio mm -hmm. was something that was going around the Mediterranean for at least a thousand years. We've got Krishna, who was in India a thousand years before Christ. Krishna was a carpenter, born of a virgin, baptized in a river. Are you saying that was written in history? That was written down in well, history? Reminder to hit the subscribe button below and turn on the notification bell to stay up to date as new videos come out. And if you're interested in supporting this ministry, just go to justscripture.org and click on the support page. The virgin birth narrative is coming to us all from a variety of critics who want to dismiss them as unhistorical stories about Jesus' conception and birth. A simple search will lead you to many articles produced over the years and after you get down the road of it, you'll see that many of them are just regurgitations of themselves and basically are there to try to plant seeds of doubt into believers' minds and discredit one of the main Christian tenets in the Christian faith. If you fall down this dark path with these articles, is that you'll eventually find yourself seeing other produced works that make the entire Christian religion seem as if it's one gigantic concocted lie. And since Jesus' birth is the first narrative in the New Testament, it follows that this is where they typically start. But it might surprise you that you'll even find church leaders and theologians rejecting the historicity of the virgin birth narratives. In recent years, Episcopalian Bishop John Shelby Spong has called for a complete rejection of the virgin birth stories. John Dominic Crossing, a former Catholic priest and prominent member of the Jesus Seminar, wrote that I understand the virginal conception of Jesus to be a confessional statement about Jesus' status and not a biological statement about Mary's body. It is later faith in Jesus as an adult retrojected mythologically onto Jesus as an infant. The late founder of the Jesus Seminar, Robert Funk, wrote that, We can be certain that Mary did not conceive Jesus without the assistance of human sperm. It is unclear whether Joseph or some other unnamed male was the biological father of Jesus. It is possible that Jesus was illegitimate. United Methodist Church Bishop of Northern Illinois, Joseph Sprague, said in a school address that the myth of the virgin birth was not intended as historical fact, but was employed, i.e. invented, by Matthew and Luke in different ways to appoint poetically the truth about Jesus as experienced in the emerging church. Former Southern Baptist, the late Cecil Sherman, advocated that a teacher might as also be led by scripture not to believe in the virgin birth, should not be fired. But you might be thinking, yeah, I get it. There's always going to be critics and skeptics out there who, you know, try to undermine the Bible. And yeah, there's always going to be some rogue liberal pastors out there who teach a non-historical interpretation. But as a whole, you know, the church is pretty much sticking to the tr traditional interpretation. Well, not so fast. Because a recent Pew Research survey was done to see if views on the narratives have shifted at all. They found that there has been a 5% decrease amongst Christians believing in the historical interpretation of the virgin birth stories in just a three-year span. And when the demographics are broken up is that the falling away increases more and more as the demographic gets younger and younger. And we're likely at the point today where less than half of those under the age of 40 still believe in the virgin birth. Now the claims against the virgin birth come from three different angles. First is the pagan by claiming that it's nothing but repackaged pagan myths that Matthew and Luke incorporated into their Gospels because they were so influenced by the Hellenistic Roman culture of the day. 
Second is the New Testament so-called majority silence on Jesus' conception and birth by saying that Paul, Mark, and John never mentioned it. And since Paul's works predate Matthew and Luke, that these narratives were invented much later to embellish their Messiah story. And the third claim is that Matthew made a gross error by applying Isaiah 7.14's prophecy to Jesus because the Hebrew word Alma does not mean virgin, but young woman. And that he relied on a Greek mistranslation of the word, and also that the prophecy was intended for King Ahaz in his time, and not about some far distant future event. So, it might seem like they have a lot of ammunition to fire here at the birth narratives, but what we'll actually see is that they're actually shooting blanks at us. But, as we move on throughout this series, is that you're actually going to see why a virgin birth is necessitated by the Old Testament's description of who the King Messiah would be. First thing to clarify here is, is that we're not actually defending the actual birth of Jesus, but his conception. Because this is the actual miraculous part of the story. Luke 2.6 specifies that Mary had a regular pregnancy and a regular, likely very painful, delivery, and even went through the normal purification process that all other Israelite mothers had to obey in order to become ritually clean again in order to enter sacred space. So, there is nothing miraculous about the birth, it's only the conception that brings the supernatural element into the story. Now, the first claim is presented in a causation scenario in that, since the pagan myths will all predate the Gospels, and since there are so many shared elements between them, that this proves that the Gospel writers were influenced by the stories and even downright plagiarized some of them. And it's not just Jesus' birth that these critics will say that this occurred in, but basically his entire ministry, death, resurrection, and ascension were pagan ripoffs. But, for our purpose here, we're just going to analyze the two main ones that they say that this is where they stole the virgin birth story from. The first on the block is the Hindu god Krishna. There are four main texts that describe the stories of Krishna. The earliest extent sources of these texts should be the first alarming thing that you should notice here. Only the Mahabharata has portions preserved that are dated earlier than the New Testament, and the rest of them come hundreds of years after the New Testament's composition. But what we're really after here is, was Krishna born of a virgin? And the answer is, no. He is actually described as the eighth son of Devaki, with his older brothers being killed by Kamsa. But his conception, if you want to call it that, was special, or in a way miraculous, because it describes him being mentally transmitted into the mind, not the womb, of his mother. So, how do critics call that a virgin birth? Well, since the conception was in a way miraculous and didn't involve sexual intercourse, then in a way it's kind of like a virgin birth. Well. That's kind of deceptive and playing loose with the words. Yeah. But for all intents and purposes, let's move on to Horus and see if there's any similarities between him and Jesus. He is the son of Osiris and Isis. The question again is, how was he conceived? Plutarch wrote that Isis indeed conceived Horus legitimately, meaning through her marriage with Osiris while he was being compared to Anubis, who was described as a bastard offspring. He said that Osiris and Isis fell in love with each other and copulated under the cloak of darkness in the womb, and out came Horus. An Egyptian relief shows Isis hovering over the deceased Osiris in order to conceive and bring forth Horus, who is shown on the left. And yes, you heard that right. Osiris is dead in this procreative scene. The story is, is that Isis revives him just enough to get impregnated by him. The hymn to Osiris can be found on a stela currently in the Louvre Museum. It reads, Isis the powerful, protector of her brother, 
who sought him tirelessly. Yes, they were brother and sister, who took in his seed and created the heir. Welcome, Osiris' son, Horus, stout of heart, justified, son of Isis, heir of Osiris. Notice that Isis took in his seed in order to create, or really procreate, their son Horus. That easily shows that this is not a virgin conception and birth. But you might be thinking, do Egyptologists agree with this interpretation? Yes, they do. Richard Wilkinson said, Isis revived Osiris' sexual member in order to get impregnated. Geraldine Harris said that Isis revived Osiris' sexual power in order to create Horus. Barbara Lesko, when speaking on the relief, said that the dead Osiris was revived just enough in order to impregnate his wife. And Dunnan and Zevi said that sexual intercourse was involved in order to give birth to Horus. Kind of aggravating, isn't it? Because whether you believe in the Gospels, virgin birth stories or not, is that this is a completely unfounded claim that the critics have presented as stone cold facts. So, you really gotta ask yourself, was if Bill Maher, Peter Joseph, Christopher Hitchens, or any other critic, was that, were they completely ignorant on this matter? Or did they have an agenda at hand? Take your pick. But what's really awesome is just sometimes, just sometimes, they actually admit that there is absolutely no evidence for their claims. Reminder, hit the subscribe button below, turn on the notification bell, hit the like button, and leave a comment. And don't forget to visit us at JustScripture.org. But in the meantime, stay salty.